Welcome to Crossroads. This is a casual conversation with friends who help, who happen to be pastors in New England. Uh, and together we're gonna explore the intersection of our Christian faith with our culture. Uh, I'm Dave Hammer, and I'm the pastor of Danville Baptist Church in New Hampshire. And to my left are uh, Michael John, who's at Market Street Baptist Church in Amesbury, and uh, Brian Bethke at Middleton Congregational Church, and Rick Harrington at First Baptist Church of Haverhill. Thanks for joining us tonight, guys. Thanks, Dave. In, in 1978, Billy Joel sang these words, I don't need you to worry for me because I'm all right. I don't want you to tell me it's time to come home. I don't care what you say anymore. This is my life. Go ahead with your own life. Leave me alone. And in those, in that, uh, those four lines, Billy Joel expressed one of the core convictions of the age in which we live, uh, a, a conviction which has been called individualism. It's, it's in the air that we breathe, and we hear it in taglines like, follow your heart and live your truth. Um, it could be defined in a lot of different ways, but I'll just, I'll just share this one. It's the, individualism holds that the goal of life, that the way to be happy, that the purpose of life is to express your unique inner self. You know, I, who you are doesn't come from out there. In fact, if there's anything that would restrict your expression of who you think you are, that needs to be done away with. Those restrictions need to be removed by society. Um, I wanna ask you guys, how do you see uh, individualism at work in our society? You know, just what are some examples, some ways you see it playing out? Yeah, I think right now every bit of, uh, it seems to me, every bit of technology and advancement that we make as a society is designed to promote this sense of um, we don't need other people, that we can, we can live life on our own, and I think especially in social media is probably the area where I, s I think we see it the most. When you have a whole website dedicated to yourself yeah. and Facebook and, and expressing yourself constantly and your thoughts and everything is put forward, um, this, and this is cheered and championed, I think that's, that's it's almost like the culmination of this individualism that we're, we're, you're talking about here. Where literally life revolves around me and I am presenting myself out there to everyone and we have the means to do that now um, so that's one area where I would I would say I'll turn to these guys here for for other yeah I mean I think we see it too in the idea of work I mean yeah. it's interesting we find ourselves right now in a in a I don't know we call it a post COVID but we're kind of in the midst of this kind of we feel like we're on the downslope of it at least I would hope and um, we have this idea in which like we can't find people to work mm -hmm. Because the idea of like, well, you know, this like my reality is my reality and, you know, the idea of the common good doesn't exist anymore. Mm -hmm. I mean, we're seeing things like these employers that are giving extremely crazy incentives and people are like, I don't want to work. Mm -hmm. Why would I need to work? I don't need to work because I don't feel like I need to work. And so my in, the way I express my individualism is through, you know, whatever it is like I'm doing in my own reality. And so and we see that really right now in the sense of like the common good and expressed in um, a, a healthy idea of work. Yep. So yep. can I add on to that a little bit, too, yeah. where, where the you know, work, the, the purpose of work is not to is primarily now to find something fulfilling, find a job that's yeah. fulfilling to you. Um, as opposed to something that is needed in yeah. the culture. So, so you look down upon the necessary job that someone has yeah. to do, truck driver or you know, yeah. plumber or things like this that are necessary, the dirty jobs kind of mm -hmm. thing, um, and you esteem, I want to be an artist, I want to be these kind of things that really are fulfilling to me yeah. and not necessarily the, the kind of work that uh, provides for society or even just provides for my family. That's yeah. so. I don't know if I'm getting ahead a little bit here, Dave, but certainly in issues of faith, religion, spirituality, there's a strong push for the individual. So <clears throat> whereas I think most people saw their faith um, in the past tied to a community, a church, a synagogue, a mosque, whatever it is, that we see uh, statistically the rise of the nuns, and not N-U-N-S, but N-O-N-E-S, you know, the, the, those who would say they have no religious affiliation. 
Uh, not necessarily meaning they don't believe in God, not, not even meaning they're not spiritual, but that they don't affiliate with any traditional established religion. Um, it's my, my faith. I sort of make it as sort of unique to me as I want, yeah. and I'm not really accountable or connected to a community necessarily. Yeah, yeah. And that's, that's interesting you bring about the nuns, Rick, because it's like we go and we, we see certain statistics that say most people would classify themselves as born-again Christians or there's a high percentage that would cons consider themselves that they believe in God or you know whatever you know criteria that that is especially like when we go to vote or like mm -hmm. what do you identify yourself as but then when different polls or statisticians look at things they they do that nuns category comes out in the sense of my um, the privatization of my faith has increased because of individualism instead of seeing myself as part of uh, a community, as part of seeing myself, my, my salvation, my belief in Jesus Christ played out in the context of, 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 of the corporate body. Mm -hmm. And so it's interesting. I know a guy who just r recently wrote a book on that. Too, right? <laughs> yeah. yeah, just uh, uh, about, about what it means to be part of a church. Yeah, right? exactly. Yeah, so. yeah. But I think what we see is, you know, um, again, statistically, if you look at generationally, you got to the sort of baby boomers and Gen X and so forth, um, millennials who are kind of the adults now, uh, Gen Z kind of following. Millennials are the least church um, people in the history of the United States, mm. least connected with the church. And uh, behind that is Gen X. And then, so it, it's clearly moving in the direction of disestablished religion or faith or spirituality not connected to a religious community. And would you say that spirituality, when people say that I'm, I'm, I'm not religious, I'm spiritual, that that is kind of this individuality too, mm -hmm. this individualism that, you know, religion is something that we identify with a group of a, of a, a group setting, sort of that others have defined for us yeah. and we buy into that. Mm -hmm. Whereas when I say I'm spiritual, you, you have no idea what I believe. If I say I'm a Catholic or I'm a Protestant or I'm a Muslim, you have a, a sense of a creed here. But if I say I'm spiritual, you have no idea. Mm -hmm. right. it's, it's whatever I feel at the moment. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. Well, let me ask you guys this. In a moment, we're, I want to ask you guys what you see as some of the negatives mm -hmm. of the emphasis on individualism and then the Christian alternative. But before we get in that direction, what do you see as the, you know, the pieces of truth, the parts of that, that ideology of individualism that, you know, they, they touch on some biblical truths there, even if they in some ways deform them eventually. But yeah. you know, what truths do you see in this emphasis on? Oh, I think, I think that, that we are not numbers and, hmm. and uh, yeah. that we are... Each individual is made in the image of God yeah. and after his likeness and is, is of sacred worth from, yeah. from the, we would say, from the womb to the tomb, from the unborn to those who are even on, you know, on ventilators and ICUs. They are made in the image of God. They are special. There is, and I remember uh, hearing a speech from, um, I think it was Ronald Reagan was talking at one point. It was a debate or something. And someone, there was a, some senator who referred uh, to the American people as the masses. Mm. And Reagan took such offense at that. He says, they are not the masses, they are citizens. And that whole sense of that every American was an individual, We're not like the Soviet Union mm. and these communist countries where you just see the masses, numbered people with no identities. They all just kind of fold into each other of no of sacred worth. But yeah. as individuals, I, I'm, I'm a big fan of of American individualism as opposed to other systems, though it good, though good. will fall short. Good, good examples. And I think too, you, you know, when you think of it, true individualism or in, being an individual only uh, makes sense from a Christian or at least a divine perspective. Yeah. Because if we are no more than our physical bodies, then we are part of, I mean, literally <coughs> our bodies die, they decay, they become part of the ground and part of a system that, that is ongoing. Yeah. We are just part of a sort of the singularity of the, the universe, yeah. unless we are also spiritual creatures made individually in the image of God mm -hmm. and existing beyond our body. So ironically, the only way we can actually truly be individual mm -hmm. is if there's a God who's made us beyond what we, yeah. beyond, beyond merely yeah. the physical. So. Yeah, I think, the, you know, even if we think of this theologically, mm -hmm. you know, the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, there's a level of individualism there. Mm -hmm. There's a, a, yeah. a level of diversity there but yet there's unity there yeah you know you wouldn't say that the father is the son or the son is the spirit yeah. um, and so 
we could think through that even in the context as if, if we are as, as a people are a result of the outpouring of the love relationship between the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, yeah. and we are created in the image of God, then there's a level of individualism, mm -hmm. there's a uniqueness, there's a, uh, a sacredness, a specialty to each and every one of us yeah. that God has crafted before the foundations of the, of the world, mm -hmm. and it means something. And yeah. so I think it clearly, like, individualism, individualism does, like, there, there is something there mm -hmm. in, in Scripture about right. that. Yeah. And so, yeah. That's good. And, and the parable that comes to mind is the, uh, the shepherd, who Jesus compares himself to the shepherd who has 100 sheep, and one of them goes astray, and he leaves the 99 to yeah. find the one. Yeah. Yeah. And that's a powerful picture of he's not weighing costs here that, uh, that every one of his good. sheep is good. precious yeah. as an individual, um, not just, oh, we got 99, don't have to worry about that one. It's too yeah. dangerous, not worth the risk. Uh, to go after one little sheep when I've got 99 here. It's like, no, there's, when Christ looks at us in that way that he says, you know, all that the Father's given me will come to me and I will not lose one of them. Yeah. yeah. You know, there's that sense, that, mm -hmm. that, that preciousness of the individual. Yeah. Yeah, part of this is just, uh, we, we, we tend towards an, an either or thinking, mm -hmm. instead of a both and thinking. Yeah. And because the both and thinking requires us to embrace attention. Yeah. yeah. And we don't like tension. We like to tie up things in a nice mm -hmm. bow. Yeah. And so it's either individualism or it's, uh, you know, kind of a communalism. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So. Good, good. Well, I, I want to ask you guys what you what you see as kind of the, the pitfalls or dangers of this way of thinking and living. But and to lead into that, I want to read an, an example from Instagram. Uh, a woman, after divorcing her husband, uh, she, po she posted a picture of herself with her new girlfriend, and she had the following caption on there. She wrote, I want you to refuse to betray yourself, not just for you, for all of us. Because what the world needs in order to grow, in order to relax, in order to find peace, in order to become brave, is to watch one woman at a time live her truth without asking permission or offering explanation, because love wins. Mm -hmm. So you don't have to comment on that directly, but you could. But what are some of the concerns or pitfalls you see with, with this emphasis on individualism? Yeah, that little pronoun before truth, um, her truth, yeah. um, that my truth, your truth. And so as that we each sort of define reality, it then becomes in a s chaos. If, if my truth says something completely different than your truth, what do you do with this? Yeah. And then we have, then we're really just living in, in separate, on separate planets here that we really can have no meaningful interaction if, if all truth is individualized like that, where we can't, there's no objective common truth that we see and we can, we can rally around, we can have no relationship. And so uh, the funny thing is, she says at the end, love wins, love loses in yeah. this. It, when, when it's her truth and my truth, because how, does, how do the people in her life feel about this? Yeah. You know, yeah. their truth doesn't matter that you've abandoned them, that you've hurt them, that doesn't matter. Yeah. Um, so I, th I think it's uh, very concerning what yeah. he says there. Good, good. Uh, other concerns yeah. about individualism, how can uh, it go wrong? Just similarly to what uh, Michael said about the, the, the truth. So a lot of times when people say my truth or your truth, what they really mean is you know, my perspective. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> uh, although I think it does betray a different view of truth. So if truth is reality, what is outside of us, even if human beings didn't exist, it's just there. And we sort of interact with it. And so if we're wrong in how we perceive it, it's not truth that needs to be changed, it's us. We, we've yeah. come to a, um, so, but instead of saying there really isn't a clear objective sense of what's out there, there's only my perspective of what's out there. Um, so that becomes my truth or yeah. your truth. And um, so I think in the quote, kind of putting it in the context, what she's saying is basically, again, I need to be an individual who understands reality from a, my own unique perspective, and that's what the world needs, is for every person to just be, look at the world through their own lens and sort of interpret every, all of reality based on how they want it to be, so then they want to see it, which is very different than yeah. I think most of history has seen yeah, truth yeah. as that which is, regardless of my perspective of it. Yeah. So. Yeah, I think, I think her statement is actually pretty cruel um, because, because the highest ethic is individualism and the highest ethic is my reality, yeah. 
Therefore, anything or anybody that violates that, my truth, my reality, to express my individualism, that is, um, I don't care about that. It's about me and what I want to do. Mm, yeah. And and that is, um, we go and we'll champion something like that and we'll go, yeah, way to go, right? That's, that's, that's great, you're expressing your true self. But the wake of the destruction of that statement mm, uh-huh. is the most unloving thing that you could possibly think about. And we don't think about that because it doesn't sound politically correct. It doesn't yeah. sound, um, but what, it, what, you know, so like, like when I think about that, that statement actually pretty much, it, it grieves me because I think behind yeah. that, what about yeah. the husband? What about if there's kids involved? What yeah. about yeah. all of the family aspects of things, yeah. you know? Um, but again, if your highest ethic is individualism and you created your own reality, then who cares? Because that's the highest ethic. Yeah. yeah. And you've, you've locked yourself in your room and truth is only what you see and what you perceive and there's nothing to learn. Uh-huh. N- and anyone who contradicts that, anyone who would try to say something other than what is truth to you must be a lie, it must be rejected if, it doesn't, if it's not consistent with what I'm seeing already. And therefore your worldview can never change or grow because you, you don't allow for other perspectives to come in when you start speaking about your understanding as my truth. Well, once you've got truth, it's over, right? I mean, there's no more debate. We discover the truth, and now there's no, no more, nothing more to say about this. Yeah. You know, if I could quote another Billy Joel song, you know, one of my favorite songs that he sings is uh, "Angry Young Man," huh. about this, you know, this political activist young man who's always raising his fist in the air. And there's one line he says where he says, um, "And he's and he and he he's never able to learn from mistakes, so he can't understand why his heart always breaks." Huh. And there's a sense of this is the destiny of situation of where people are are so convinced of themselves and, and, and are encouraged by society and reaffirm this is your truth um, they can't understand why they're heartbroken why they're in pain all the time yeah. how can I be in pain if if I'm living in the truth yeah and it becomes it, it it's not just cruel to others it's cruel to herself yeah and I think part of this too and the, the foundational aspect of this too is we talked about it a little bit on our last episode, not to rehash that, but yeah. this idea of when you re- remove the transcendent God, the God, the creator God, who is the moral lawgiver, who creates boundaries, who, who is clear on what truth is, who defines mm-hmm. truth, who defines all of these things, then you have to do it yourself. And so therefore, once I become the moral lawgiver, once I become the arbitrator of truth, then when you invade that, that is offensive to me. Yeah. But now you have like, it's like, it's crazy town because now you have all these people that are rolling around that are like, well, this is my truth, that's your truth. And we're having these issues right now. Yeah. And it's just, it's, 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 um, yeah, it's yeah. crazy. It, 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 you, there's no common ground. I think that's you were right. kind of t- guess, touching on it. So that I- if you said it's my perspective of reality, my experience, then of course there can be conversation. There mm-hmm. can be, you know, mutually trying to understand each other. Okay, I don't know what it's like to grow up that way. I don't know what it's like to have experienced what you, you experienced. But we can try to come mm-hmm. towards a better understanding of reality f- with one another. Mm-hmm. But if you have already arrived at truth and the other person's already arrived at truth, there is no way you're coming together now. Everybody lives, in, like you said, in their own room, like locked away in their own room. Yeah. Uh, mm-hmm. I think that's sort of ex- individualism in its extreme. You, yeah. you, it's like narcissism, uh, yeah. but literally, or a philosophical narcissism, where you're the only one that really exists, um, and that you define the world as, as you see it. People are only, only exist really in relation to you, yeah. which is, I think, an, ex- an extreme view of yeah. individualism. Um, I was just listening to a podcast the other day, um, Freakonomics, and they had a sociologist on there, and he was saying that there are other countries than America that have a high value on individualism, but America is so high that it's actually an outlier even among other individualistic countries. Mm -hmm. And um, I don't think it would be that difficult to look at a lot of societal problems that our country has Mm -hmm. and see a role that individualism has had uh, in, in many societal problems. So what I want to do now is I want to look at 
the biblical alternative. And, and I want to look at two different pictures from the scripture of what the good life looks like. And one of them shows what our relationship with God is supposed to be like, that we're not supposed to live independently from him, but dependent upon him. And then the other one is going to show how we're supposed to live in relation with each other, not independent of each other, but interdependently. So for the first one, the first uh, picture, I'm going to turn to Psalm 23, which is relatively well known, even as people know less and less of the scriptures these days. So Psalm 23, uh, here's an alternative vision of the good life than individualism. The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside still waters. He restores my soul. He leads me in paths of righteousness for his namesake. Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil. My cup overflows. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I shall dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Uh, what do you think of, of that vision of, of the good life in contrast with individualism? How, yeah. Where do you think it's better? Where do you think it's more beautiful? How do you think it challenges it? I don't know, go any way with it that you'd like. It doesn't sound like the good life. It, the, from the beginning of the Bible to the end, he's constantly calling us sheep. His mm -hmm. people, his, you're my sheep. And you know, we are his people, the sheep of his pastor. Jesus calls, Jesus says to Peter, feed my sheep. Constantly calling. Is there, is there an animal that is more insulting to call <laughs> us than a sheep? When you think about it, we even talked about that thing, sheeple. The, the, people that, the whole picture of these, these animals are not smart. They're not strong. They're easy meals for the enemies. They have to have a shepherd. Have you ever seen this picture of the sheep that escape and they live on their own in the wild and they never get shorn and, they, and they're overwhelmed by the weight of their, they can't even cut their own hair. I mean, they're, they, <laughs> if, without human beings, they perish. Yeah. I mean, there is, I mean, why couldn't we be lions? You know, that would be amazing. Or elephants or something, some kind of, even a skunk can defend <laughs> himself. But he calls us sheep and it's, it, it just insults that mm -hmm. pride that is in me, which needs to be insulted. And, but in the end, what you find is, you know, I was just sharing with a, a, a couple, a, a, a woman and her son just lost um, their hu her husband. Uh, and so to, to, as they're wrestling with this, reading that psalm to the situation and reminding them, you know, we don't have to be strong. Yeah. We don't have to be smart. Sheep are not smart. They're not strong. You don't have to wonder if you're strong enough, you're not. You don't have to wonder if you're smart enough, you're not. You don't have to w wonder if you have the enough courage, you don't. Yeah. You have a good shepherd. Um, without the shepherd, that's despairing, but the shepherd brings it all together. Um, so that is a great confrontation to that. I, I think of any animal more than any other, <laughs> it really drives that home. And yeah. a, a, it is sort of a comforting factor. So we usually, re you know, this is mostly read at um, funerals. I think I've I think I've probably read it at every, every funeral I've done, I would yeah. imagine, I've officiated. Um, and we emphasize the idea of the v walking through the valley of the shadow of death, the, the, the dark valley, the Salma Vet, the, probably the dry wadis, you know, that are dangerous. But we miss the fact that he leads me to green pastures mm -hmm. and besides still waters. So even though these sheep are relatively vulnerable yeah. and there are wolves and there are thieves <laughs> and there are lions, they can sort of, there were lions in the Middle East, by the way, it's not, yeah. not, not the type that we have, you know, think of in Africa, but um, they can just relax, just lay down and chew on the cut of the, <laughs> the green grass and go sip at the water and not even worry because they have a shepherd who's overseeing this whole thing. And so even when he has to lead him into the dark valley, he says, I, I, I fear no evil because he's got his rod, you know, which mm -hmm. he, he could fend off any type of any attack. Yeah. So the sheep almost get a chance to just rest in the fact that the shepherd is more powerful and stronger and is overseeing us than, and, than I could oversee myself anyway, yeah. you know. So uh, picturing yeah. our, in terms of our relationship with God, you know, yeah. that we are not independent of the shepherd. So. Yeah. yeah, when I was, in, when I was um, deployed, um, this was early in, in the early 2000s during when Iraq was kicked off. Um, there was this idea in which, you know, you're in the red, like, and so, like, they have these, like, different colors in which, like, like, your awareness, 
Hmm. And like when you're in the red, it means you're like you're like ready to roll. Like it's you're 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 constantly looking your 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 anxieties up you're constantly mm -hmm. aware of your situation but you can only live in the red so long yeah because when you live in the red too long you have you you have a nervous breakdown hmm. and so you know you would go back and there was times in which we would have you know intentional times where there was a sanctuary in which we were protected and we would we could the red you know we could not be in the red anymore and it would just be totally relaxed and um you know one thing i think this 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 the season has taught us is that we can't live in the red all the time yeah. we can't live in the red all the time we need a shepherd we need a sanctuary we need a place where we could just know that we are we are taken care of that we are we are good we are protected and um and that uh, that is an affront to individualism because if you are an individual and all you do and you are your you, you know basically you're your own god and you create your own reality yeah. then you have to be in the red all of the time yeah, yeah. and that is exhausting mm -hmm. yeah, that's good. and that's a different that is a, a totally different uh vision or message of the gospel yeah. of jesus christ that's good. You know, I think too, Dave, he leads me. Yeah. He leads me to green path. So sheep don't get to decide where they're going, right? Yeah. They're led. So uh, they're not individual. Uh, you know, I would think that those who are individualistic would say, I create my own green pastures. Yeah. Right? And, and I'll, I'm going to stay out of the dark valleys and I can make sure I don't face them. But that's not true. We all know that's not true because you, you can't go through life and not face dark valleys. Like you, you go through life and then you get cancer or you lose someone you love and you face that dark valley. So we, we, the sheep understand, I'm not in control ultimately of the green pastures and the dark valleys. He's leading me, but he's with me in the green pastures. He's with me in the dark valleys, which I think is why it's used at funerals so often is because yeah. that's a dark valley, that time of grief and loss in which we recognize, okay, God is sovereign. He's brought me through this. He's with me even in the midst of it. And so. in the midst of that, see, the thing is, and I love this, this is obviously, you know, I know we're in New England, so the risk of, you know, the idea of mis being misunderstood with the, the, the Puritan writers, but, you know, especially like the Valley of Vision, if you read that, the idea in which I walk through this, the deepest, the, 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 the deeper the valley, from a Christian perspective, the brighter the light of Christ shines. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. Because, and, and, but if you don't have Christ, if you don't, are, are not part of the body, the, the, you know, part of that, then it's just dark yeah. Yeah. and that's horrible yeah that's sad yeah. and i think it sort of seems like one of the uh, most terrifying thing is to be alone is to be wow. out there with no one looking after you yeah. no, that there's there is there's no one looking out for you what a terrifying thing that is i don't care how no matter how strong you are that's right. i was watching the series alone on, uh, I think it's on Netflix, and the whole thing where they put survival experts in places by themselves and see how long they can survive. Mm -hmm. They give them some tools, but they're completely by themselves. And it's amazing mm -hmm. how fast some of the strongest survivalists tap out yeah. because, I mean, they twist their ankle. And there's no one that can help them now. They, 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 they bruise their knee or they... You know, they get, they get a virus, and, and some of them nearly died in this. They, they keep monitoring very closely, but yeah. how vulnerable we are, yeah. and when we take individual, I think it's a really helpful exercise to take your, your values and kind of push them and mm -hmm. see where they lead. Yeah. And is that really where you want to go? If yeah. individualism is the ultimate thing, if my truth and, and, and the way I understand things and that doing it my way, it leads you to alone. Yeah. It leads you to be, and, and that's a terrifying place. And you're like, okay, that, I need to change roads here. Yeah. Let, let me ask you guys another question. Is, uh, well, we're, we're all pastors, so we're shepherds, and we, we oversee and care for people. But we're also sheep. Yeah. And I, I just want to, I wonder if you could personally tell us, what, what's it like for you to live as a sheep, to live in dependence mm -hmm. uh, upon God? Either maybe you talk about a, a specific circumstance in your life, what, what that's meant, or in day-to-day -day life, what does it mean for you to live in dependence mm. upon God? Mm. Yeah, I mean, I think um, it's humbling. Hmm. 
I think that I think that um, to think that as a pastor that I'm somehow removed from the 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 residue of our culture and uh, and and the values of our culture would be you know ridiculous to think that and mm -hmm. and and to think that like you know and my, my natural tendency is to look inwards and to be in my own individual mm -hmm. and 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 because it's it feeds my own pride and my own sense of worth in some really weird way yeah and so for me to humble myself between a god and know that i'm completely dependent yeah. on god especially like you know you know um you know, I, I, I'm a retired Marine. Nothing phases me. I mean, bullets bounce off of me, <laughs> right? No, not really, you know? But the point is, is it's, it's humbling. Yeah. It's humbling. I get it. Like, I get it. It's humbling. It's a, it's a, it's a blow to the ego. Yeah. I want to share one experience this past year that we had that I think really taught my wife and I to um, what it's like to trust God. So we, mm. we live in a parsonage for, that our church owns. It was one in Amesbury that we owned, and we, the church owned, and we've lived, been living there for over 20 years. And then uh, the circumstances change, and we have different needs, and we're, we got permission to, to sell the house and to purchase a new one. Yeah. Um, we didn't realize the market and how things were going to go, and when we sold it, we sold it for a lot more, and it sold very fast. But then it took us nine months before we were found the house that we were going to live in next. And so all along the way, it was just step by step. And just this whole notion of this is really putting this into practice of like the Lord's our shepherd. He's going to take care of our needs. Whatever that looks like, he knows what we need. And it was amazing how each step of the way, he provided exactly what we needed when we needed it. And so the first couple months, we were staying with some friends up in Dover, very dear friends, and we're able to walk with them through some, some difficult times. And it was such a blessing to reconnect with them. And then we had to move, and we ended up in another parsonage that church dear friends of ours opened up their parsonage, and it was, uh, it was for a quadriplegic pastor who had retired, so it was all handicapped accessible. Little did I know that within a week of us being there, my wife would break her foot and be in a wheelchair, oh, and goodness. I would get COVID and be laid up, and no one could come see us. But because it was handicapped accessible, she was able to care for me during that time, and we, it was the, the perfect setting for us. We would have never survived at my old house. And then from there, another place opens up just in time. Uh, we're on the beach during the winter, which is, if you're going to have a beach house in Hampton, winter is the best time. <laughs> Don't go in the summertime, the winter time. And then as soon as that was up, we got a house. Hmm. You know, and it was, it was amazing how it was like, just God, just, and I, in, in this market, and that's a miracle to get a house in this market. But we were thinking, you know, we only need one house. We don't need a million, just, just one. And the Lord provides. And it was, but it was that all on the way practicing that of just like, okay, is he, do I really believe that he's my shepherd, that he is going to provide a place for me? It doesn't need to be a, a luxurious place, but a place that will meet my needs at this time. Yeah. And a wonderful experience of that. It really strengthened our faith more than yeah. anything else, that trial. Yeah. yeah. You know, it's, 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 it's really an interesting um, thing with the, the physical needs and how God speaks to those physical needs. And um, you know, I didn't really share a personal story because, you know, I don't know. But I do want to, like, I'll say, like, I, mean, I can remember just speaking, you know, I can remember being, again, uh, deployed, 120 degree weather, um, doing this extremely hard mission, and we're in the middle of nowhere on the Syrian border, mm -hmm. run out of water. Mm. Again, I'm a big... Big bad Marine, I'm with a bunch of Special Forces guys. We don't have water. Hmm. There's no way we're getting water. No one's going to give us water. You're making me thirsty, man. <laughs> I know. I actually want to take a drink. Um, and we're, we're, I mean, literally, I'm th thinking to myself, Nick, we're taking extreme measures to hydrate hmm. that you oh. could possibly think about. And I'm thinking, you know, yeah, I'm 20-something years old, but um, I'm going to die. Hmm. I'm so dependent. Hmm. 
And finally, we got they dropped some. The uh, a helicopter was able to drop some water off. We had a hike pretty far. All of us were pretty, pretty badly beat up. We grabbed the water, and in the midst of drinking that water, I know it's a weird thought, but I remember having this thought. It was like, Jesus is the living water, mm. and how dependent I am on Jesus, and how dependent I'm on this water. But it was just it was just an interesting kind of weird kind of thing that happened. Yeah. Yeah. But just the dependency is so yeah. huge. We're so fragile. Yeah. Yeah. And everything about our physical existence screams at us uh, that we are dependent people. That, absolutely. How many ways can you die? Not just with water, but with no food, if you don't get enough sleep, if you get a virus, if you get this or that. There's so many ways that we can perish and, and so much that we need to survive. Yeah. Mm-hmm. yeah. R- Rick, I didn't, I didn't, we didn't hear from you. What, what's it like for you, you know, day-to-day life or specific circumstances to live in dependence upon God? Sure, sure. So um, I was thinking... Um, I'm over the hill officially now, 43, and so, uh, but I, I, I grew up in the United States, like everyone, like everyone here, I think, um, hearing you could be anything, yeah. Yeah. You, know, you could do anything with your life, which is, has its positives, but, so, it's not entirely <laughs> true, right, so, um, I, I think I, for a long time, I struggled with, you know, hey, I, I I'm, would be great to be a lawyer, and a, or maybe I should go into politics, or being a, sort of a, at one point I even looked into like CIA, you know, what would it mean to, you know, and coming to a point where, no, I, I think my path in life has kind of been set now. Um, you only get one life and you can only use it one way. Mm-hmm. It's just, I mean, I don't know what the future holds. Anything could happen. But um, coming to grips with the reality that God has his plan and he's working it out in my life and that's it. And if I spend my life faithfully ministering, serving my congregation, mm-hmm. First Baptist Haverhill, passing it on to the next person, dying and going to be with Jesus, that's a life well lived. Mm-hmm. And, th- and that's okay. Uh, so it's a recognition of my limitations as a human being. I'm one creature, one, one being that God has made among many, many others. And this is a good life. This is a good plan for my life. And I'm submitting to a greater planner than yeah. myself. So, yeah, yeah, good words. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, you know, for, for me, um, it's funny. I mean, as a pastor, you'd hope that you, the person would be a pretty mature Christian. But I... You know, I regularly don't, I regularly forget that I'm dependent upon God. Mm. And, uh, you know, so I'm trying to live, you know, on my own. And then inevitably a horrible frustration comes or a pain or something doesn't go my way. And I'm thrown back, I'm forced by circumstances to remember, say the truths of Psalm 23, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. And Mm. I, I realize, okay, yeah, I don't have the thing I thought I needed, or I'm deeply hurt by what happened, but... God is taking care of me, and um, and I'm going to have everything I need, and and I and I just need to remind myself of these truths. And so I guess par- partly mention that to say I don't know if, I don't think there is some t- such a thing as a super Christian, you know, who's who's like living this victorious uh, sheep with a shepherd life. You know, I think we're continually going astray, being brought back, and it's so good. Uh, it's good to re- be reminded of our dependence uh, yeah. on God. L- let me ask you guys, before we go to the next, uh, another section, if, if someone's watching this and, and they, don't ha- they don't know the Psalm 23 life, they don't know what it is to live mm-hmm. with, Je- with Jesus as their good shepherd, uh, what would, uh, let me just throw it to, let's go back to Rick. Rick, what would you say to the person? They don't know Jesus as their good shepherd. Maybe they're intrigued. Maybe they're interested. What might you say to them? That I, I would say, uh, well, one, I think we're, you've already made the connection, but the, the shepherd ultimately is Jesus. So in the Old Testament, the Lord is my shepherd. And in the New Testament, it makes the connection that Jesus is that shepherd and that he sees the ultimate danger coming for the sheep, which is um, judgment for sin, you know, the wrath of God. We talked about it in the first session. And he lays down his life for the sheep. Mm. You know, that, that he, it's not just... He's a shepherd, and you know, he, true danger comes to the sheep, and he's like, "I'm out of here." Yeah. He sees it and says, "Then I'll I'll die. I'll I'll step in the way of whatever is coming to for the sheep to rescue them and to save them." Yeah. And not only is that does that mean we're those who are connected to Jesus are safe from judgment, but it demonstrates what it what kind of shepherd he is. Yeah. So he's a good shepherd he actually cares about you you know i would say it's, that it's not just transactional he loves you he's going to oversee your life and ultimately it will be for the best yeah. his plan is better than yours you, you know we, uh, than mine you know whatever i think i could do with my life or whatever um 
his is better. Yeah. It's going to be better, right? It's going to it's going to take you to places you you weren't expecting to go. He's going to meet people you weren't expecting to meet. It's an exciting life, and he's a good, faithful shepherd. He's going to lead you in the right direction. He's trustworthy. And it's not just pride that keeps us from coming to Christ. That's a big one, but fear too, yeah. and the fear of will he reject me? Mm. If I if I come, that's the greatest fear. I'm 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 out there on my own, wandering in the wilderness, but if I come to the fold, will he laugh at me? Mm. Will he turn me away? Will he reject me? That's a terrifying thought because you know how shameful you are and mm. you know how wretched you are. And, and then that's where the, the cross is, is, as we come back to the cross again every time, that's our hope. That removes all the fears when we see that he died for me. Yeah. He died for my sins. He took my place. Um, and through his sacrifice on the cross, I can be forgiven and cleansed and clothed. He even, he even clothes me with his righteousness so that uh, my shame is covered and he will not turn me away. And then I don't have to be afraid he's gonna neglect me because goodness, if he's willing to die for me, how will he not also give me everything that I need? How will he neglect me if he's, you, you don't. It's like if you spend all your life savings on a, on a car, are you gonna drive it recklessly? Are you gonna take care of it? You're gonna take care of it, how much more? Will Christ take care of his sheep? And, um, yeah. yeah, I think the whole thing, too, with individualism is um, when people say, like, well, you don't know me. Hmm. And you're right, I don't know you. But Jesus does, hmm. and Jesus knows exactly what you're feeling and what you're going through. That's the exclusive claim of Christianity is that we have a Savior hmm. that has entered into our um, experience and to an extreme level that none of us have experienced. And so my, my, my response to them would be, stop settling for so much less. Mm -hmm. yeah. You're settling for so much less, yeah. and it's time to come home and rest. Amen. That's great. And isn't that what yeah. repentance is? It's coming home. Turn around, come home. You gotta humble yourself to do that. Yeah. But come home. Good. I think that's the plea. Yeah, so, so one, one aspect of the, the Christian alternative to individualism is living in dependence, you know, conscious dependence, daily dependence upon a God who loves us and provides for us. Another aspect is described in a, in a passage from 1 Corinthians 12. And here, I, this passage describes God's vision of how his people will live together, the church. But I think it also applies to how, how human beings are meant to, to relate to one another as well. So I'm going to read this. It's a little bit longer than the last one, I believe, but I'm going to read from 1 Corinthians 12. It says this, for the body that is the community of Christians, does not consist of one member, but of many. If the foot should say, because I am not a hand, I do not belong to the body, that would not make it any less a part of the body. And if the ear should say, because I am not an eye, I do not belong to the body, that would not make it any less a part of the body. If the whole body were an eye, where would the sense of hearing, where would be the sense of hearing? If the whole body were an ear, where would be the sense of smell? But as it is, God arranged the members of the body, the church, or, and even the human community, each one of them as he chose. If all were a single member, where would the body be? As it is, there are many parts, yet one body. So my, my question for you is, is how does this, uh, this uh, alternative vision of, of the way we're meant to live, you know, wh wh how does it challenge and, and how is it more beautiful than the, the individualism we described at the beginning? Yeah, I would say that there's a difference between the Christian community and the human community in the okay. sense of interdependence because okay. the thing is, is so you, so uh, um, the Western world, especially the United States, I mean, individualism is baked into our DNA, it's just who we are. You go to Africa, you go to the Global South, and I spent time with, um, I have many friends who are Africans, and they have this philosophy, Ubuntu, I am because you are, you are because I am, this idea in which when you succeed, I succeed, and when I fail, you fail. There's this, yeah. this interdependency. However, that sounds great, mm -hmm. but I mean, things in the Global South aren't great either. Yeah. And because it can become very pragmatic and utilitarian, and so we, we tend to, 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 to take those in all these different directions. Like, I am because you are, because listen, I won't, like, 
I hope you succeed because it, it has a benefit to me. Mm -hmm. The Christian vision is this idea in which I am seeking your good. Um, I'm, seeking, I'm seeking the sake of the other for the glory of God yeah. because I am so deeply loved by the triune God. It's, uh, it's this idea in which, in which I am living out, I've been grafted in, and this is all theological deep waters, but I've been grafted in into the Trinitarian Father, Son, Holy Spirit love union yeah. and I want to live that out. It's a totally, it's about motivation. My motivation isn't for myself. It's, it's sacrificial. It's Christ-centered versus it's utilitarian. So it's different, but there is a level in which this interdependency is so essential yeah. to our lives. Okay. So I don't know. I went a little that's off, great. but that's great. That's great. yeah, I think I learn a lot from watching movies. Good there movies. You, go. you know, I refer to these often. You're a little bit of a nerd with I the movies. I am. And I, 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 why, why does certain, you know, there's formulas to movies, and one formula I want to reflect upon is the sports movie, mm -hmm. the inspiring sports movie. It's, it's how does it, the, the story is almost always the same. You have this group of individual players mm -hmm. who've got talent, but they've got attitude, mm -hmm. <laughs> and they hate each other or whatever, mm -hmm. and then the coach comes in and whips them into shape, and they learn to love each other and play like a team, and they get out there and they win the championship. Yeah. And, and people see that, Th that's so standard, it's almost every, every sports movie you yeah. see has yeah. that same formula. Just, just pick a sport, soccer, or basketball, football, Bad same news thing. bears. Exactly. Yeah. But that captures the truth. It resonates mm -hmm. because it's true. Yeah. And it captures that truth that there is a oneness to us, that we're connected and we need each other. And, yeah. But there's also this individualism where we appreciate each other. The mm -hmm. differences are there. If, it was, if this was like... Um, turns into some kind of a communist setting where everyone is exactly the same and they're just cogs in the machine. It's like, that's, dis that's a dystopian future. Yeah, the biblical view is <coughs> unity, not uniformity. Exactly. We're all the same. Yes. You know, we're not the Borg, you know what I mean, rolling around. Yeah, you know. and the human body pictures that. You have, you, we are so clearly individual members of our body. We, we name them all and, they, and they're so different from one another, yet we don't think of ourselves as a collection of parts. But I am one body yes, with right. many members. So is with Christ. I think that's what scares a lot of people about dependence on other people. Is uh, Does that mean I have to conform to you and to who you are? Or that I have to conform others to who I am? And uh, that one of the beautiful parts about that is that you don't. In fact, it, it would not work if the whole body were the same. Mm -hmm. right? So um, you know, th I think the specific context is the local church. And in my church, there are people who are so different than me different ages, different, uh, certainly different races and ethnicities, different personalities, different sort of spiritual gifting and talents and experiences. And that's what makes it work. It's not only that it works in spite of that, that's what makes it work. If everyone was preachers, if everyone in my church was a preacher, we would never get anything done because we'd all try to preach. It just doesn't work, right? So having that diversity is what real true unity looks is able to come about. That God has made us individuals, mm -hmm. as we said, we're spiritual creatures who uh, are unique. Um, what can a man give in exchange for his soul, the whole world for his soul? So we're, we are uniquely individual, but we work in dependence upon others who are different than us yeah. and yet still still united. So you know, I preached on on that text years ago, and one of the as we went through the First Corinthians twelve to fourteen, and at the end, it was this vision of worship that was formed that really challenged me and because so that if you think of worship as a meal together or the or meal that we have in fact these are elements in the worship breaking bread and so forth but that formally it would be you would see I would see worship as like a, a re going to a restaurant mm -hmm. right you go to a restaurant and the, they, they've got a good cook and good service and you're like you're happy there and if if somebody at table six gets sick you don't care as long as your meal mm -hmm. was properly served and tastes good and doesn't really matter to you what happens at that table over there. It's your personal experience. That was that individualistic understanding of it. And when I go through that, those three chapters, that that's not what worship is. It's, it's a Thanksgiving meal where we're a family and everyone brings yeah. dishes together and we share and we all eat together. And if one person at your Thanksgiving table this month, if one person goes home hungry, or hurt or upset it's a disaster for everyone mm -hmm. you know it's it's not like McDonald's where it doesn't matter if the guy behind you gets upset 
this is a family meal, you know, and so everyone brings something and we all eat together and everyone has to be enjoying this, otherwise it's a disaster. Yeah. So yeah. that's that that I love those three chapters. I think they're really helpful in this yeah. in our reflection. Yeah. If, 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 if God intends the, the, the body of Christ, the church, to, fo to uh, live like a body, like, you know, interdependently, w what are some ways that the individualism of our society has, has uh, you know, come into the church and preventing us from living this way? What are some ways that we're, we're missing this in, in the church? I mean, I think that when we see even, you just brought up worship, I think the idea yeah. of worship, you know, the idea in which... Um, uh, my worship is private, and mm -hmm. so it's it's all about my alone time. Common prayer, common worship doesn't matter. This idea in which, well, I really don't need to go to church, yeah. physically be there. I could just jump online. Mm -hmm. This idea in which, when I partake of the sacraments of you know communion and baptism, it really doesn't have a communal aspect to this, mm -hmm. as if your salvation is only about you and Jesus and. I'm just going to tell the Christians that are listening to this that your salvation is not about you and Jesus. It's about, yes, in some ways, it's about you putting your faith in Christ, but it's lived out in community. Mm -hmm. and, and then that salvation is being worked out in community, in a community of Jesus. Yeah. And if you're not doing that, then that's, that's an issue. That's a problem. Yeah. And I think we see that in individualism where we've basically crafted kind of a Burger King attitude towards Christianity. I have it my way. Yeah. And that's a problem. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Just that similarly, that we have kind of pushed for a consumer mentality. That you go to a church to find what you want to get out of it. So, and if it in in the day it stops meeting the needs that you want, you move on to the next one. Mm. And what that has then created is people who look at church as what do I get out of it, rather than the body that we are part of something. So that when things go bad, I don't run away. I I get down and dirty to help, yeah. or I get hurt, I gotta learn how to forgive. I gotta learn how to ask for forgiveness. You know, and that's part of the whole process of sanctification. Is yeah. It's not simply like McDonald's, Burger King, you know, get yeah. your way right away. Uh, it's, okay, this is my family. This is, these are my people. This is, this, I'm part of something bigger than myself and I have to stick it out even when it's hard. Yeah. Obviously, we don't have to get you know, too detailed, but there are abusive situations and there are reasons to leave a church. I'm not saying there aren't. Uh, obviously, you, know, you don't want to be in a place that's in any way <coughs> endangering you. But the day-to-day -day peccadilloes that we face are meant to be there as part of our sanctification process yeah. in a yeah. church. You know, yeah. so. And the, we've devalued the, the fellowship of the saints. We've really um, we've put such an emphasis on the personal study, the personal prayer time, your personal quiet time. And when you look at the scripture, it's like they didn't really do quiet times in the scriptures. Now, did they? They didn't have Bibles of their own that they, they yeah, had they to gather. They read scripture out loud. They had know? to. And, and in Acts 2, they're meeting every day. They're meeting in the temple and in yeah. their homes. And there's something. Sh and and, and we're, we, like, we want to recapture the power and the glory of the church in the book of Acts. But we want to do it apart from that which made it so powerful. Yeah, and, 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 and Michael, I just want to say this because I think people, I just want to put this out on the thing. And I tell this to my congregation. People are weird. Church people are weird, all right? We come together and it's a bunch of weirdos coming together that come from all different walks of life, it's true. Mm -hmm. And you're sitting there and you're like, the only way this is gonna work is because God has brought us together and it's the Holy Spirit. That's the only way Absolutely. this is gonna work because Amen. you're weird and I'm weird and I, 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 yeah. I don't jive with you. Like, this is weird. <laughs> yeah. We've referred to ourselves as the island of misfit That's boys right. yeah. many times, so yeah. yeah. I've said to my congregation, you know, what would ever bring this group of people together. Yeah. I mean, you know, you have, uh, let's say, an 80-something year old lady and uh, a 15-year-old, you know, kid who likes rap music and, like, what would ever bring these people into the same, like, mm. family, based spiritual family outside of the gospel, outside yeah. of Christ? That, and that's that is what brings so together. beautiful, yeah. right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. That is beautiful. That is something that our world seeks, seeks this diversity but instead we retreat to individualism, which leads to uniformity. Yeah. That's the only way we can have unity is we have to be the same. Yeah. Yes. I gotta, I gotta surround myself with people who are like me. That's the only way I can have community. That's right. That, that mentality. Can I just, one, I want one last thought here from me is Thanksgiving coming up and you know, I, we love getting together with our family, we've got a big family, and I, I can't tell you how I always overestimate how much I will enjoy 
Thanksgiving with my blood family, my relatives. I look forward to it, and I'm always a little bit disappointed. And I always underestimate how much I enjoy the gathering of God's people together. When we have people, I will have folks from the church over. All right, fine, okay. And then it's amazing how powerful that time is, that that spiritual bond is so wonderful and life-giving. Uh, I don't come away exhausted as I often do at family gatherings. It's, uh, it's a profound thing that I, I'm really praying that we, that our, the churches just, just get our wind back in us to value this again and make the effort to connect with each other. Good. Let me, let me ask you a question, it's kind of along those lines. Uh, I know we're near our end of our time, but there's a person watching. They're part of a church. They're a Christian, um, but they're but they're pretty lonely, and they and they hear about the body of Christ being a body, being interconnected. <coughs> they go to church on Sundays, but they just they their lives are not connected with other people in the body of Christ. They see they see the pastor connecting. They see some other gifted people connecting with one another. Uh, for one reason or another, they're, they're just not connected with the body in a life-giving way. And, and, and they'd like to be. What might one, any of you say to them? You know, try to put yourself out there. Try to, try to get involved in a small group. You know, f find out where, where there is opportunity to do that. And I know that's not always easy and there aren't always opportunities. Some churches just don't have much. But um, usually there's, you know, a, a good church will have some type of like small group Bible study or something. Get involved, try to get yourself involved in a place where you can have relationships outside of Sunday morning. Um, don't wait for, we, you know, we, we always tend to say, people are not friendly to me. Well, what if, are you making the first step? I know that maybe you say, well, that's not fair, how come they're not? But just you make the first step. Go ahead and jump in and, and try and see what kind of relationships you start to build with other people. I'm going to need to cut it off because we're, we're just about out of time. So thank you, men, for uh, getting together to talk. It's been good. And um, thank you for joining us. Until next time, may the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ fill your life. Amen. Mm -hmm.